your sole purpose in this army? To do whatever you tell me, drill sergeant? Lieutenant, tell your men to get down. We're going to light up the sky. We got a Black Hawk down. We got a Black Hawk down. Broken Arrow! You've heard Bomber Month. I'm saying it! Broken Arrow! We've had F-15 Month. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Okay! Come on, move out! Well, hold on to your berets, because now it's Army Aviation Month. We have planes stuck up in every thousand feet, from 7 to 35,000. Look out, sir! What kind of training, son? The first four Mondays in August will feature topics on fixed-wing Army aircraft, Army flight school, various rotary wing aircraft, and the lethal AH-64 Apache gunship. Never mind the fluff. Let's get straight to it with your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome back to Army Aviation Month here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Jello, and this week we're discussing Army Flight School with Chief Warrant Officer 2, Nick Allen of the United States Army. Nick, how's it going? I'm doing good, Jello. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's no problem. Welcome to. Yeah, good, good. Where are you dialing in from? I should probably know this. <laughs> Uh, I'm currently up at Joint Base Lewis McCord up in Washington State. Okay, excellent. All right, now you had a chance to listen to last week's episode, I think, already. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Oh, good. All right, well, we're going to leverage off some of our discussion with Aaron in our talk today. But before we get to that, you know the drill. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school, if you did? And what are you doing these days? All right, so I was originally born in California around the La Mirada area. And then about halfway, like, say about year 12 of my life, I moved out to North Carolina. And from there, I did not go to uh, any sort of college. However, I did join the North Carolina National Guard while I was there. Okay. So I worked on the Alpha and Delta model Apaches for seven years while I was there before I got out and joined the civilian sector. And then sometime there in that period, I decided I want to get back in so I could fly because... Aviation has been my whole life, so I was able to join back up and go active duty this time and do this awesome flight school program. All right. And so what are you flying these days? So I'm currently in the UH-60 Mike aircraft. Oh, well, we had an episode back, episode 40, I believe it was, on the H-60, and we titled it C and Black Hawk, but I'm guessing we missed a few things. So if we have some time after flight school, let's talk about what we might have missed on our Seahawk slash Black Hawk episode. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds perfect. All right, good. All right, and then so how many years of service are you at at this point? So total, I'm sitting around 11 years. Okay, and how recently did you go through flight school? It was about... Two and a half. Yeah, about two and a half years ago. <laughs> okay, excellent. And how many flight hours are, are you up to? Oh, uh, 350 total. Good. So you're the perfect guy to talk about flight school because <laughs> yeah. you have relative recency and you're not over the hill, shall we say, and, and uh, you're still relatively new in your flying career, sounds like. Oh, yeah, I definitely am. Oh, good. All right. Outstanding. Well, I don't know the first thing about Army Flight School, but I do know a little bit about Navy Flight School, although I went through probably before you were born, but uh, I started in 93 (laughs) and was winged in 95 and then finished at what we call the FRS, where I flew the F-18 in 96 and 7, I think it was. No, 6. So let's start big picture. So what are the phases that are a part of army flight school. So for example, the Navy, since I left added a little, I don't know what to call it, but I, they call it IFS. It's like an introduction and they go out and fly around in a Cessna just to see if people are aeronautically adaptable. Do you guys start with something like that? Not even close. Days kind of hope that your <laughs> aeronautical aptitude is high enough. So okay. <laughs> where it generally starts, is just kind of like the admin kind of, I guess you guys had indoctrination. It's kind of like that. But we start with like our Wobic and Bullock. So Warrant Officer Basic Course and Basic Officer Leadership Course. Okay. You just learn general Army aviation because you've been working with Army for so long. Then you're like, oh, yes, we have to do aviation, which is a whole different area of the Army. Right. From there, we go on to our SEER. And eventually, we'll get into what's called IERW, which is Initial Entry Rotary Wing Training. And this is where you, you all call it contact, but it's 
like the initial phase where you just learn how to just operate an aircraft out inside the civilian world. Mm-hmm. Then we move on to your selection, which after selection, you'll go into your advanced training and then you'll start to hone more into your craft. And then after that, you'll do like y'all have carrier landings. We kind of mm-hmm. have like an air assault exercise, which is kind of the bread and butter for us in the army is doing that air assault. The capstone almost. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then from there, you show up to your unit and that's where you start all your additional add-on training. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. How long is the warrant officer or the basic officer course? Roughly around three, four weeks. It changes. They always define tune it. Okay. This is a general course on like you learn how to do vehicle recognition because you're actually low enough on the ground to actually see these vehicles. You actually get a tour of every airframe the army has. So that way they can kind of persuade you to come over to their side. <laughs> Okay. So it's like a dog and pony sales show kind of thing. Exactly. All right. That makes sense. Is this where you learn or where do you learn like basic meteorology and aerodynamics and stuff like that? So that will actually happen while you're learning to fly the aircraft at the same time. Okay. So once you complete Wobick, you go off to your seer and then it's been hit and miss about the dunker training. But after that, you'll do your air medical. Oh, and that's where you'll learn about hypoxia, how to wear your flight suit, and the effects of flying on your body. Mm-hmm. It's roughly a two-week-long course, and that's where you really start to get the feel of actually being an Army aviator. Okay. When I think of SEER, I think of the survival, evasion, resistance, escape. But are you also including in there kind of the like water survival type stuff, like if you end up ditching and going in dunkers and things like that? So our SEER is completely separate from that okay. because while we're – Doing our seer as aviators, we get rangers in, special forces, kind of a mix of people that just need to do their seer course. And that being which part? Like if you get captured kind of part or downed and it just is a general like survive. Oh gosh. Yeah, survive, evade, resist, and escape, I think. Correct. Yeah. Survive, escape, resist, and escape. Okay. Once you finish that, then you'll do the dunker, which is ditching from aircraft. So they have a great big cylinder. They strap you in and uh, put it in the pool, turn you upside down. And the idea is if you were in a helicopter that landed in the water, crashes, frankly, that you can get out of it. Correct. It's a whole day of clearing out your sciences as you're flipped upside <laughs> down inside the dark. That's right. Okay. So let's say you get through all that. Okay. Last week, Aaron was saying like the, maybe it's not the Wobick, but like the course to become a warrant officer, is that before Wobick? Cause he was saying it was almost like boot camp again. Correct. It's before that. So okay, we get people that's known as street to seat people that join and then have no prior army training. They'll do basic and then come straight to warrant officer candidate school. Okay. And just like it was saying, like back in night before 92, you're a wax candidate the whole entire time. Yeah. And then once you finish flight school, then you pass on. But they since then changed that. <laughs> Thank goodness for those poor souls. Okay. Oh, yes. And then the kids coming from, I mean, young adults, but uh, ROTCs and military academies, they're not getting hazed again. I, I, we shouldn't call it that because it's not hazing, but they're not getting harassed again, right? They're just going straight into the basic officer type course now. Correct. So they'll, they'll show up there and do their Bullock while we do our Wobick. Okay. So once you show up, now this is for me, just, I don't know. I used the word queer one time on the show and people got like raised eyebrows at me, but it's a, it's a legitimate word now. Come on. Like in the Navy and the Marine Corps, we start off in a propeller airplane and then learn how to fly helicopters. You guys go straight to helicopters. Correct. So as uh, Aaron was talking about, majority of our fleet is made up of helicopters. So right. why we're going to teach people how to fly fix wing if majority of them aren't going to fly them so they focus mainly on rotary wing okay it does sound daunting because unlike an airplane when you like air controls the aircraft will keep flying forward you like it with these controls the aircraft wants to try to kill you so (laughs) yeah there is that let's talk about the aircraft too what trainer is the first thing that you're flying as it stands right now it's the luh 72 lakota and the TH-67 Creek, which is basically a Bell 206. Okay. Whenever I went through, it was a two-to-two ratio. So for every two Lakota classes that started up, two 67 classes would go after that. And now it's about a three-to-one ratio. So they still haven't fully phased out the TH-67 yet. 
but they will eventually do that. And the Lakota is that a pretty, I mean, obviously when you're in flight school, you're thinking about performance and grades and all that, but is it pretty enjoyable to fly or is it difficult or? From what everyone else has said about it, it's a great aircraft. It's a glass cockpit. It's got a couple of flight controls, so you can hook up to your Garmin and fly the route that you want it to. The only thing you got control is just the collected to go up and down. Mm. But the 67, it's still all steam gauges. The only thing that's in there is a small little Garmin, so you can just do your instrument training. But <laughs> when you first start, you don't even have trim. Once you go to instruments, then you get trim on the cyclic and then it's like oh this is a great big feature now that i can actually kind of help manage the aircraft <laughs> wait a minute do they like take it out or disconnect it or, or they just don't allow you to use it so it's just not even in the initial aircraft <laughs> until you actually show up two instruments then it's like oh okay now there's a trim button so it's kind of interesting how it works oh man <laughs> But I think Aaron was saying a lot of what you guys do, I don't know if it's still true, but it's relatively day VMC. Is that true? Or are you guys doing a lot more night and inclement weather stuff? So how it starts for the initial entry rotary wing is you'll actually do two weeks of just learning how the aircraft starts or just how it functions, all the systems and everything. And then you'll start your mm-hmm. visual flight roll flying, your VFR flying okay. before you move on to your extra courses. All right. Now, I think I probably derailed my own self earlier. Um, we were talking about length of courses. So a couple of weeks doing some of the SEER stuff and all that. And then you mentioned the other phases. I've already forgotten the acronyms, but all said and done from a guy who's starting at Wobick, let's say, and a guy who, or gal, of course, but who, uh, I don't know when you get your wings or when you check in to fly, whatever you're going to fly in what we would call the fleet. Uh, how long is that process? So going through with no bubbles, it averaged about a year and a half. Okay. We had some issues. Well, I know when I went through with the Apaches, but they're straightening that up. And there's people two years. So it's shorter than y'all's because we do a lot of stuff actually at the unit once we show up. Okay. So, all right. So let's get back then to you show up to the first phase after the Wilbic stuff and you're learning aerodynamics and meteorology and you're out flying i take it this is a full job i mean it's like long days every day you're not doing anything else right exactly your one job is just to do flight school and nothing else okay how it usually works is you'll have a day flight or night afternoon flight and then on the opposite side of that schedule you'll be doing a class of aerodynamics weather something like that and will you go through in a cohort with other students? And so you might all have a flight in the morning and then sit in a class together in the afternoon? Yeah. So how it worked for myself is my class, we kind of divide it in half. It's like, okay, y'all will be the afternoon class for uh, this week. And next week, you'll switch to mornings and vice versa. Do you still keep in touch with those folks? Because I know I still have some friends from flight school, and that's been <laughs> getting on 30 years. Oh, yeah. My stick buddy that I went through fly school with, I probably call him at least once or every other week just to check up. But we, we <laughs> see each other all the time. Aviation is a small community. Oh, yeah. We'll see each other at training events all the time. Oh, cool. What's a stick buddy? I've not heard that term. So it's basically the other guy that's going through with you through flight school. So how it works is you'll have your instructor and you'll be paired with someone else and you'll do like an hour and a half of flying and then you'll switch your sick buddy will do the other hour and a half of flying okay that way it's, it kind of divides it up gives you a break so when you're not on the controls are you what in the back seat just kind of chilling but also watching what's going on and trying to learn correct so like for the lakotas i know they say in the back seat for us in the 67 we go out to these stage fields i know you guys have them in like pensacola where you just do traffic patterns if we're scattered all everywhere in alabama mm-hmm. yeah You'll land, you'll get out, and you'll just hang out inside a little hut until it's your time, and then you'll just swap out and go, and then pick them up at the last part of the flight and go back home. <laughs> so you guys are studying together and you know challenging each other on procedures and emergency procedures and all that? Correct. Okay, cool. Now, you said Alabama. Is that where pretty much the training is? Oh, yes. If you're actually a warrant officer, minus your basic training, you will do your walks all the way to the end of flight school, all in Fort Rucker, Alabama. Hmm. Not much variety, huh? Yeah, we like to say that the Navy and the Air Force shows the better locations uh, over there at Eglin and down at Pensacola while we're up in middle of nowhere, Alabama. (laughs) Well, that may be better. You're not distracted by young people that are uh, in town on spring break. I only say that because that's how I met my wife (laughs) (laughs) while I was in flight school or about to start it anyway. What's it like? 
for the students and the instructors? Is it the relationship? Is it cordial? Is it, I don't know how to describe it, but I mean, are they trying to help you succeed or are they trying to beat you down? What's that like? It's a very professional atmosphere. Like your initial entry rotary training, Mm -hmm. you'll actually be with a contractor that's teaching you how to fly the aircraft. So you actually won't be with a green suitor. Oh, wow. And they're not going to scream at you, I'd hope. No, they try not to. There's been some people that, you know, every instructor has their way of teaching. And as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, when you show up the next day, it's actually going to be a relatively easy day. But when you forgot to study your daily questions or your EPs and limits, then it's it starts to make things a little bit harder to teach at that time. I would think a good instructor can tell pretty quick who has prepared and taken it seriously and who hasn't. Yes. At the beginning of every flight, you'll do what's called daily questions where they'll call on someone, you'll stand up and they'll ask you a question and you'll just kind of be like, uh, this is what I got for the answer. And like, it's your yes or no. Or they'll give you like an EP, like you've been struck by lightning. What do you do? And it's auto rotate. So, yeah. Well, they want to know you're prepared. So for me, when I flew the T-34 Turbo Mentor, I think I did 13 flights dueled up and then I had a solo and I was no kidding by myself. Is there a student solo, maybe you and your stick buddy that you guys go out and, and just fly together or do they have something like that? Before I showed up, they're doing like just you by yourself solo. And then when I went through into 67, it was you and another person going through fly school and you just do a traffic pattern like three times and then it's like, okay, you soloed, but you'll find out that majority of our aircraft, you'll never be solo. You'll always have that other person inside the cockpit. So, right. I just thought there could be some joy in just letting, especially if it was someone you've labored with all that time to just go out the two of you. But on the other hand, sometimes one plus one can be dangerous if it's two students. Hey, let's try this. But usually people are smart enough to just stick within the usual rules. But okay, so they used to fly them with literally just one pilot. That's interesting. Yeah, so that was later on in the training when you get inside the OH-58. And that's a single pilot aircraft, so you're actually able to go out there and do that. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah, that's coming up next week on our show. We've got a gentleman prepared to talk about that. So tell me more about the, oh, darn it, I forgot the terminology already, but you know the capstone uh, field exercise you guys have. Because again, for us, at the end of our jet training, we will spend days, sometimes weeks, just going round and round doing what we call field carrier landing practice, getting ready to go out to the boat. And of course, that part is solo. But for you guys, what did you say you have? And, and tell us a little bit about it. So at the very end of all the training, it's known as planning an air assault. Air assault is for us and the Army is basically seizing key terrain uh, against the enemy to secure a location. We'll get the attack guys, the Apaches in with us on the lift side and the Chinook guys. And it's basically, you have to capture this area and what's the best way to do it. And you'll have other CW4s and CW3s that kind of help you, but it's very student-led. For instance, like the attack guys, like we have to get in there and either A, I destroy a certain amount of enemies and then make sure it's clear. And then we can bring in the lift guys to drop off the troops and then the Chinooks can come in and drop off artillery pieces, fuel blivets, et cetera. Cool. And all are all those aircraft flown by students as well? So we won't actually do it in the aircraft. We'll do it in what's known as an AVCAT, which is basically a simulator that allows you to do that. So it would just be you and another student in that aircraft okay. as you're doing the mission. Do you ever shoot any weapons? I mean, I know a lot of aircraft, it's not the pilots that are shooting anyway, but in an A4, in my jet training, I was able to shoot the forward firing gun and drop some little 25 pound bombs. Are there any weapons employment in the year training? So for us in the lift and the cargo community, we won't do any of that shooting, Okay, but the attack guys, so will at least go out with known as gunnery and they'll shoot the 30 millimeter and the 275 rockets around the ranges up there in the northern part of Fort Rucker. But that's after they get in the appropriate platform? Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. So it was the same thing for me when I got to the FA-18 squadron for training. At the time, it was VMFAT 101 and El Toro. Then, of course, we went out and dropped bombs, and we didn't shoot any missiles, but we did drop a few things. So what's the attrition rate like? Do most people make it? Do most people not? What's it like? So I know for my class, a lot of people make it, and we're very mixed. My class, we had studies from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, 
Afghanistan, Jordan, the Dutch were there as well. And <laughs> everyone was just picking up fine. We had maybe one person fell out of something, but usually they'll get recycled back or they'll get additional hours. And so it's not like they want you to fail. They want you to succeed in this. They'll put the time and effort to help you. But if you're not helping them help you, then eventually you'll get let go. Okay. And again, I think it comes down to attitude and effort as our coaches all told us for those of us who played sports as kids. But that reminds me of that. I again, got distracted by the shiny thing when we were talking about screamers, I guess. So you fly with contractors and then once you fly with green suits, which I assume are just more senior pilots that come back and do an instructor tour, those guys and gals are generally pretty uh, willing to help you out. Exactly. Everyone's being paid to essentially help you continue on through flight school. Right. Well, I mean, you're an investment. If the hard decision needs to be made that you're just not getting it for whatever reason, whether it's effort or otherwise, well, then that hard decision has to be made. But, you know, if the person's putting forth the effort and they just need a little extra push, usually you can get there. All right. So once you get done with, at what point, I guess what I want to ask is, do you figure out where you're going next? In other words, you went to lift, as you call it, some guys go to attack. At what point does that decision get made and what's it made based on? Once you finish your initial entry rotary wing, they'll take what's known as the OML order of merit list and set you up. You'll have to take a PT test, which surprisingly, the PT test has came down to actually deciding where you fall in that list really? because it's so competitive through flight school. You want to do so well, and then you can't neglect doing PT because that helps them place where you're at. Hmm. They're still in the process of changing it it's what it's known for us as a selection and when i went through we actually could see what all aircrafts were available to choose and now they're kind of you have a wish list and they'll just tell you there yeah that's very common so i sometimes get different questions on the show the one i sometimes get is does it matter where you're from in other words if two folks uh, students let's say are tied will they look at one and say oh he went to the military academy and this other one went to an ROTC so we'll give it to the west point guy i mean do they do anything like that or is it just based on when you sh- walk in the door your performance from that point forward exactly you're it's everything that you have done up to that point it doesn't matter like for instance i was an apache background everyone thought I was going to go attack, but obviously I went lift now. And when it came to my selection, we can see like we had one Chinook and five Apaches and like five Blackhawks you can choose from. So when they called your name, if there's something up there, you can go grab it. Oh, wow. Uh, one of my good friends, he finished top of the class. There's one Chinook. He was actually talking about Apaches the whole time. And he's just, I don't know what happened. I just got up there. My finger just went straight to Chinook and just took it. <laughs> and just like that, it was gone. No one else can get it. <laughs> I wonder if that's why he did it. All right. Do you keep in touch with him? Does he like his choice? Oh yeah. He loves it. So I would say, honestly, no one ever regrets their choice. I know there's been people that's been upset before, but we like to dish on each other about like, Oh, you guys are the Apaches. You guys are the so-and-so and like us on the lift. But all in all, at the end of the day, you're still flying an aircraft. Yeah. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that, Nick, because that's a lot like Navy flight school and and where people end up. And I'm constantly telling the young people who write to me, oh, what if I don't get jets? And I say, that's okay. That might actually be better. You know, not everybody's going to get jets. Not everybody's going to get Apaches. uh, And only one guy got a Chinook. And so the point is everybody has their own path and no two paths are exactly the same. And, And so you just have to find peace with it. That being said, do people ever later switch? So it's once you make your selection, that is it. There's been times down the road where your unit will ask you to switch over to a different platform based on the needs of the army hmm. and the unit. But nine times out of 10, you're going to stay inside your airframe. Yeah. You'll switch between like variations such as Alpha Lima, Blackhawks, and Mikes, but you're essentially still in the same airframe. Okay. And then once you get to, we would call it the FRS, but what would you call it where, in your case, you actually learn to fly the Blackhawk? What's that organization? That's going to be our advanced training. Okay. And that's when you continue on. You'll learn. I know for me in the 67, I never flew at night, unlike the 72s. So we had to go through an MVG class and it's like, okay, this is very interesting. You're learning now to fly and hover an aircraft, which takes a long time to learn. And now you have 
two toilet paper rolls essentially on your eyes at night trying to fly. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make it uh, very easy at all. And then even when you get done with advanced training and you get to your first we would call it a squatter and I assume it's the same, but you're not really done, are you? Then there's qualifications to become, do you guys call it a hack? We have what's known as our medal, which is our mission task list. And every unit has something different because even though I chose Blackhawks, I can go to a medevac unit. I can go to a command and control unit, or I went to an air assault unit. From there, everyone has their own certain things they need to know for their actual task list. So, you need to learn how to do sling loads. You need to learn how to do Bambi buckets, fly with the sets, which are the fuel tanks on the aircraft. Okay. All right. So you do basically in the advanced training, you do probably a full gambit of learning your platform. And then when you get to your squadron, you've got the medals, like you said, and then it's probably, at least for me, I found it's a lifelong pursuit. I mean, you're always learning something on pretty much every flight, I would argue. Yeah, it's never stopping. I mean, even when you get up higher up and it's like, cool, I don't need to learn this stuff here. It's like, you need to continue growing because the Army's constantly throwing new stuff on the aircraft. And it's like, oh, we made a new update. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to learn to be proficient at that task. Yeah. And then so how long typically, if there is such a thing, does a person go from, we would call it from the right seat to the left seat. But I think for you all, is it the left seat to the right seat? Is, Is the right seat the more senior seat? It depends, honestly. Like okay. you'll write down like what seat do you want to fly in today, but it's known as becoming a pilot in command, and it's solely it varies based on the maturity of the pilot and the flight hours and their experience. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, because when you show up to a unit, you're what's known as RL three, which is rated level three, and you're just straight out of flight school. You can't do anything except with an instructor pilot, <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, let's go fly around the traffic pattern. Let's practice like losing an engine and doing roll on landings and all that then you progress up then you start to do your mission tasks so let's go fly low level somewhere and then once you're signed off you become an r01 pilot which means you're fully ready to go to be paired up with any pilot in command is it at that point you could theoretically deploy or could you deploy as an rl3 you can deploy at any time Hmm. it's about finding that time to get that training done because it has to be done in a certain period right. for example we we just came back from uh, the national training center and we had two rl3 pilots they weren't able to fly however they were still contributing to the overall mission of the unit okay so they were down there at, what's that fort Irwin right here in the desert of southern california yeah correct Okay. And so they weren't flying, which is a bummer, but they were in the environment. They were probably observing briefs and debriefs and the sea stories, as we would call them, of the folks that went out and did it that day. Correct. Yeah. It's all about absorbing all that information. How about formation flying? Do you do any of that in flight training itself? You won't do it inside your initial part, but in the advance, you'll do, it's known as uh, MST, which is basically mission training, where you're learning to do your sign stuff for your aircraft and yeah you'll do what's known as formation flying and you'll have one pilot up in the front a student and a ip and then it'll be yourself and another ip and you'll just be learning how to go from left side to right side distances between the disc and then basically how to land at a, a lz pretty much almost at the same time yeah i could see some value in that i would have to think for you guys Getting too close is obviously very bad (laughs) when you're spinning your wings around. Do you guys have, I'm sure, various measures in place to like, okay, we want to be at this distance. If you get within this distance, somebody has to say something or some sort of measure to interject. So for us, that helps in the lift community and the cargo community. We actually have crew chiefs and they'll tell us how many discs away we are from the other aircraft. So if you're doing like a long flight, you're going to be further away because doing formation flying takes a lot of your mental strength to Mm -hmm. focus and it it wears you out so over a long like five hour flight you'll spread out so you don't have to focus as hard but as you get closer towards the objective it's like okay we need to get closer and just fit inside a small area yeah that makes sense okay and so leading a formation i'm sure is part of the higher levels than an rl1 i'm guessing at some point down the road Correct. So it's known as flight lead. And we'll give it to a lot of our new guys, but we'll pair them up with one of our senior pilots. So that way, 
It's like, okay, you go pl- help plan the mission, but I'll be here to assist you and we'll execute. And yeah, you're not the greatest sometimes, but that's all part about learning. So it's like, okay, where did I mess up this time? Next time I know how to fix it. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And uh, anybody who's not used to hearing that is not going to do too well because you get a healthy dose of that. At least I did <laughs> quite oh, yeah. often in flight school and through most of my career, frankly. Yeah, it's all about learning to take that criticism and actually applying it to your job. No doubt. Cool, man. Well, gosh, what did I not ask you about Army flight school that we need to know? Uh, there's a big section on, it's known as BWS, which is basic warfire skills. It's probably the the most fun that you're going to have in flight school. It's a lot, very time consuming, but it's very rewarding. Uh, the thing that takes so long is you make these map books. So you have like these one over 50,000 maps and you're mm-hmm. gluing them together over the area and like you're marking the hazards and you're also marking key terrain and everything like that. And it takes about 40 hours to make this book. Oh, geez. And then you'll get paired up with the instructor for us in the 67 this is where we get to fly the alpha charlie version of the 0858 and the lakotas will continue to fly the lakotas you're learning to make a route to these random areas all over alabama and your objective is to get there plus or minus one minute while navigating off this map book and it's like okay i need you to turn to 320 and i need you to stay at 80 knots ground speed and you're getting hitting these points like, I need you to go faster. I need you to go slower. But when you land at your objective within your time period, after using a map, it's the most satisfying thing in the world. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Because you've invested so much of yourself in the preparation of that, that it's just satisfying when you do it. I don't know what word to use here, but isn't it kind of crazy though? I mean, you're never going to do that anywhere else, but I guess what they're trying to do is teach you the discipline to put effort into something, but also then the airmanship, but out in the fleet, aren't you going to have pretty much GPS and everything else you'll need to really be precise whenever you're doing something? Yeah. So every aircraft that we have has some type of movie maps, or we even have iPads that we have all the maps on. Mm -hmm. It's that foundation of your skills that, you build upon. So you're learning to, if I can do this on a map, it's only going to get easier once I actually have a movie map, I can see where I'm at. When you're flying around Alabama and you're like, okay, I'm looking for a church. There's the church. Oh, there's four churches nearby. I don't think this is the right one. I think we're lost. And your instructor's like, well, we're actually a little bit off. So you're learning to correct and get better at it. And it just makes life easier down the road when you actually have that movie map. Yeah. Well, churches are probably a good <laughs> reference point in Alabama, although maybe not. I guess there's not a whole lot of uh, mountains to uh, watch out for. Yeah, it's just rolling hills. I know I chose a church as one, and I got the wrong one. I was 10 kilometers off. I was like, all right, let's <laughs> let's refocus and figure out where we're at. I'm like, okay. Yeah, so th- there's a bit of dead reckoning involved, huh? Exactly, yeah. You're, all right. It's all about holding that speed and trusting that your pilot is going to maintain that heading. Well, I think there's probably some goodness in still doing those types of exercises because it's something you clearly remember. And let me guess, after spending 40 hours on that book or whatever with the maps in it, I'm guessing you didn't just toss it away, did you? Well, the instructor pilots actually want them. Oh, okay. Like people will sneak out the book so that way they can keep them. But a lot of times <laughs> still like, okay, we need those back. So you just can't hand it off to the next guy. Uh, okay. Well, I remember doing something similar to that in A4s, and uh, for whatever reason, I remember doing a low level in Mississippi, although we might have been over to Alabama by the time we got on the route, but I wanted to fly, I want to say, like a 094 heading, and I was flying a 084 heading, and the instructor in the back seat, he just didn't say anything for a while. He said, oh, let's just see what happens here. And <laughs> yeah, sure enough, I got you know, 30 miles down the road or whatever with the next turn point. I was pretty lost by then, but, but you know, it was a good lesson. Learn the hard way. Oh, yeah. it's It just happens. It's just, I just fire. Yeah, there you go. For sure. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate that. Let's transition then over to the Blackhawk. Now, you've thrown out a couple suffixes. So, there was what? A's, B's, and Mike's? Is that what you said? So, the common ones right now is the Alpha Limas, which are the early versions of the Blackhawk. They still have steam gauges. People love those aircraft. But you don't have a movie map. You don't have all these displays. You're looking at like little blips of dots going up and down to like, okay, that's where my torque's at compared to the mic model, which is a full glass cockpit to give you more of the situational awareness of what's going on around you. 
So it's a, what, a UH-60AL or a UH-60A and a UH-60L? So we like to just say Alpha Lima because it's generally almost close to the same because they updated them. But yeah, uh-huh. you can get one that's still an Alpha model or oh, okay. a Lima model. It's just separate. We just like to combine them. Gotcha. But they're so close, they're indistinguishable. But then the mics are, are nice and new. Okay. Oh, are yeah, the mics probably also heavier? I don't know from experience with the Alpha Levas, but we do have way more avionics and mm-hmm. we we are slightly heavier probably. Okay. Well, you told me you listened to our episode 40 with Frank and he was a Navy guy. So I'm sure we missed a few things. What's on your mind as far as what did we get right or wrong? Probably wrong is more important about the Blackhawk. Well, I mean, it's always so much you can go for. For It's like, I can't tell you too much about the Seahawk, always right. from what I've seen. But I know we weigh less because we don't have that awesome mechanism where we can fold our blades automatically with a button. Huh. We had the ability to, but we always have to do it by hand. <laughs> okay. That does save us weight there. We can fly top up to 18,000 feet. It's hard to get up there, but you can get up to 18,000 feet. Wow. Just experiencing some hypoxia along the way. <laughs> you don't have to be on supplemental oxygen above 10? Above 10, you can hang out there for an hour and then 12, 30. And then after that, you're going to need oxygen. <laughs> so you, you got time. You're like, okay, start the time. All right, let's get back yeah. below. We got to reset it. I can understand. But we we can do a lot of the same things that y'all have been adapting on to y'all Seahawks, such as the Hellfires and the Hoist. So for all the mic models, Blackhawks, we can attach a hoist to it. And then we can attach what's known as it's essentially the wings to put the stores on. So most of the time you'll see us flying around fuel tanks to give us more time, but we can actually put guns, hellfires and rockets on those. That's usually when you get into the special operations section. Okay. Well, a Blackhawk pilot have basic skills in all the different missions like lift or combat search and rescue or firing weapons, or will you tend to specialize in something? So once again, it's about the unit you go to. So the people that go to a medevac that fly the HH-60 mic, they'll focus solely on mainly medevac. So okay. they won't have to go out to gunnery because their crew chiefs don't have the, like the 240 Bravos to go shoot. But they're very proficient at medevac rescues, hoists, and high hover stuff like that. While you have us on the assault side, which we can actually uh, do so many missions. It's all about how current is that crew on that mission. Okay. Like you said, the medevac folks aren't going to be doing any kinetic stuff, but an attack unit like you might do some of the kinetic, but also, I mean, everybody's going to understand how to hover and do a hoist to pick up somebody, I'm guessing, right? So, yeah. On the, I mean, we all go to our Everyone learns how to hover, and then it just builds upon that. Yeah. Okay. But slinging loads, uh, the, are the medevac guys going to sling loads or, or just you guys? They have the ability to. I mean, if you got time, you can do it. But yeah. it's like we're going to come down as the assault unit and learn to do the sling loads. That way we can help continue after we already place the troops on the ground. Gotcha. How about night vision goggles? Are those pretty ubiquitous? Does everybody get qualified in those? Every single person. You have <laughs> every 60 days, you got to at least do an hour with the MVGs. And yeah. if you don't fly with them too often, it's. You're just relearning all over again. Yeah, like we had a little uh, special room on the base where they could turn out the lights and you could put on your helmet and your goggles and they could kind of simulate like you were flying to, to your point, reset the clock there. So, And then uh, as far as the aircraft goes itself, uh, as I understand it, other than paint, I think the aircraft are fairly similar. Maybe the mic compared to perhaps a Sierra? Maybe not. I don't know. They're pretty similar. Uh, when we upgraded to the mic, we allowed ourselves to actually have our horizontal stable layer fold up and the tail can actually fold in as well. So that way we can get into the C5s and the C17s. That way we can mm. quickly deploy somewhere. So we did take a lot of what you guys have to store in tight areas on the ship and that's employed on ourselves so we can get our aircraft easily into these either A ships or B aircraft. Okay, because obviously if a whole bunch of you need to get somewhere, you're probably not going to, uh, far away, you're probably not going to fly there necessarily. You've got to be shipped there yourself, whether it's uh, on ship or whatever. Speaking of that, do you guys do any practice landing on any sort of vessels? 
So it once again it comes down to the unit. I know the okay. people down in Honduras, they'll actually do a lot of deck quals. Hmm. And based on what, how your unit feels and if we can get that time, then yeah, we can focus on slowly integrating into our metal. All right, but let me ask you this, Nick. I'm going to put you on the spot with your 300 hours. If you were, for whatever reason, out over water doing something, and all of a sudden, like, I need to land now, and there's something flat floating, maybe it says Navy on the side, God forbid, I know. I mean, do you feel like, for example, a fixed-wing pilot trying to land on a carrier, I'm not so sure. That's pretty tough. But as long as the seas aren't pitching up and down a whole lot, do you feel like you could probably put it down provided the landing space is big enough? It's just a question of the size and the lights and things, right? If it's daytime, I wouldn't think it'd be oh, yeah. that bad. So carrier and like an amphibious ship, assault ship, generally good size of real estate. So it makes it a little bit easier. But then when you're like, go land on a frigate, it's going to be a <laughs> little bit more of a different question then. But if it's life or death and it's like, okay, we can give us a try. Yeah. But isn't that the reason, I guess, also, I think all the Blackhawks have the wheel, the tail wheel way on the back and angled. And I think, what is it, the Romeos and some of the earlier Navy models have it a little more forward and vertical so it can fit on those smaller decks. Yeah, correct. So it's like what you're talking about. You can push it like closer towards the edge. So you got more real estate then. Yeah. All right. Well, that makes sense. And of course, at night, it'd be a whole different story unless there was a some sort of lighting system. Probably a dumb question, but for us, we have to take off our night vision goggles 10 minutes before we land so our eyes can adjust because they're not useful for landing on the carrier. Are you guys doing unprepared landings with NVGs on? If it's nighttime, we can fly all our six hours we're allowed to with NVGs on from the moment we take off to the moment we land. No kidding. Okay. It's like every semi-annual period, we're supposed to get an hour of unaided, which is actually unnatural for us because we're so used to flying with night vision goggles. That's like, how do people see without being able to use these devices? Yeah, that makes sense. For us, we had to put it on, like I said, kind of up at altitude because you didn't want to bump into your wingman. And then you had to take them off in enough time to to get your eyes to adjust. Because a lot of times, for me anyway, it kind of felt like my eyes were crossed. I almost wanted to smack myself on the back of the head to get my eyes back where they need to go. All right. So I want to ask you the question I asked Aaron yesterday, as far as whether you have any good books or any other favorite books that define whether flight school or maybe any book about the mm, Black Hawk. (laughs) (laughs) So when it comes down to that, it's just like what Aaron said. If you got time to read, you better be inside your dash 10 operators manual to study your five and nines. And then every other manual that we have for me, I'm, I'm more of the technical guy. I like reading actually the manuals because that's my background. So I can't give you a good answer to that one. <laughs> Come on. You're not going to take the bait. I thought Black Hawk Down was a really good book. It is a good book. Yes, I do. Actually, that's one of the ones I do own. And then Mike Durant's <laughs> book as well. It's a very good book. It gives you that glimpse on the special operations side, along with, of course, the movie helps too. Mm-hmm. But it's our Top Gun, quote unquote. We don't yeah. like to talk about the Nicolas Cage movie that he came out with. I think it was Hellfire. <laughs> yeah, there's always a couple that nobody wants to own up to. But uh, speaking of that, our Top Gun Maverick just got pushed again till July of 21 now. So well, I saw that. I'm very yeah, disappointed yeah. in that. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing for me with Black Hawk Down, I'd read the book and then I watched the movie. I almost felt like they tried too hard to follow the book. And in doing so, I had to watch it a couple times before I could really figure out the characters and start to care about them. And I don't mean that to sound callous, like people getting shot up, you don't care. But there's something about a movie that if they develop the person before they get injured, you're more emotionally involved. And I just felt like Black Hawk Down was almost too accurate to the book and suffered a little bit as a movie. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's all about that character development, but when you're trying to give this event that happened over a course of a night and short it down into two hours, you kind of start to lose that ability yeah. for to build upon the characters. The nice part is some of us, actually, when we go through our seer, Mike Durant has actually come down and talked to oh, cool. some of the classes on his experience, so that's actually fantastic. Well, I tell you, the part I will go back to if I'm ever feeling a little, I don't know what to call it, but, you know, just I want to be kind of awash in patriotism, if you will, is when they put in uh, the two snipers. What is it? Gordon and Shugart? Yeah, and, correct. Uh, yeah. You know, the, like, you know what you're getting into, right? And you're like, yeah, put us in. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I will. Man. It's like, all right, let's go out there and let's do this. Yeah. 
Now, I'm glad there are men like that uh, and women, I'm sure, but that part just gets me every time. So, well, that's really cool. All right, Nick. Well, gosh, man, what's the future hold for you? I mean, you're 11 years in. You're going to keep playing the game and stick around a while? I'm in until they allow me to keep flying. And once they tell me no, then I start to look at other places. <laughs> A lot of us, we talk about going to the airlines, but as you see, times right now aren't the best, but... Yeah, I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all about how you feel whenever you join the Army. It's for some people and it's not for people, but yeah, it's all about how you feel. So I'll stay in until they probably tell me to stop flying, then you just kind of took all the fun out. Well, and speaking of that, I wouldn't have thought to ask you this until I learned it from Aaron last week. Are you at all interested in converting over to officer? I mean, I'm working on my degree. I don't have my degree. You'll find out with a lot of warrant officers coming in that they don't. But it's actually kind of the opposite of how people are working in the military. Like, I have a good friend. He was a captain in logistics. He actually reverted to warrant officer so that way he can actually go fly. So <laughs> you start to see it the other way around. Oh, kidding. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm actually glad you said that because I have a listener question from one of our supporters, Matthew Edwards, who wanted to know what percentage of warrant officers have a four-year degree when entering flight training. Is there anything that warrants are doing or even candidates to become a warrant that is helping them get selected in the first place? It's all about studying for, the, obviously, the ASVAB. And we had to see if we moved on to a new training test to figure out your aptitude for the aircraft. Mm -hmm. But I know for myself, working in the military and also civilian sectors of aviation, that helped myself. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times I would say it comes down to your determination of actually completing the packet mm -hmm. because the packet is not short. Mine was actually relatively short. I was about nine months through the whole process. Wow. But there's people that it takes two years, three years. And then even when the board comes up, they might be eligible, but they aren't selected. I would say actually nine times out of 10, if you resubmit that packet, they're going to be like, okay, this person really wants this. Do you, they'll get picked up. Yeah. Like so many things, once you get involved in the process, you learn some of the best practices from other people. So I'm guessing having a degree wouldn't hurt you, but maybe it's not the best use of your time. But then a lot of guys like you will work on it later because it's an asset. Correct. Yeah. It, it helps you inside your career to advance further. And it's, I know once you get out, there's jobs that are going to want that degree. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yes, aviation is fun and everything. But I know, I think some of the airlines are asking for a four-year degree. That is correct. At least it was for the airline that eventually hired me. Now, speaking of that, let's say it wasn't this COVID world we're in now. If you were to get out and wanted to go to the airlines, what would you have to do? Because you have no fixed wing time. So for us, a lot because there's that big gap of pilots that were needed, they came out with these programs called rotary transition programs, where you sign on with one of these small regionals, such as like Sky West and Horizon. And they'll say, okay, we'll help pay to train you because mm -hmm. we see that you got to have a minimum of 500 hour rotary wing and then you got to have so much fixed wing. They're like, okay, well, we can help you get to the other half because they aren't requiring as much compared to a civilian. So you can a lot of times find these companies, they'll help fund your fixed wing time and then they'll offer you bonuses and all that. You can use your GI bill to help you pay for it as well. Yeah. That's cool. Good stuff, man. Well, gosh, Nick, I can't ask you my favorite final question because you guys don't do these <laughs> silly uh, fighter pilot names, I guess. So what else is there? What didn't I ask you that we should ask? Uh, I know one thing Aaron brought up was actually about the fixed wing because yeah. he talked about it was the attaboy system where it's like, you've been in long enough and it's like, here's this fixed wing opportunity. I know if you choose, if you get selected for the Lakota for your flight training, then you actually get the opportunity to go fixed wing and it's known as the fixed wing for life. So it's like what Aaron's talking about, mm -hmm. how they're getting these people that are much higher up, but they're only staying in for three, four years before they get out. And now they're putting in these W1, W2s and they'll just fly fixed wing their whole entire career. That way they can focus and hone in on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Speaking of that, you just reminded me of a question. When you become a pilot in the Army, are you obliged to serve for a certain number of years so you don't just take off after they, no pun intended, um, <laughs> with all the, the training they put into you? 
when I I joined recently, it was a six year ad, so additional time uh, service. As of this year, they just bumped that up to ten years, and that oh, will gosh. take. Now it's really do you have that commitment, and that starts once you finish flight school. I know it's gotten some people where they have to sit there and think, do I want to do this for ten mm-hmm. years? And it's one of those things like don't just put army down as your soul branch you want to do it. look at them all because you got to remember too when you're in the army you're still doing army stuff you're still intense you're still going out <laughs> and firing your rifle once a year and all that you got to look at both sides it's not just always flying it's what you do with the extra time true well i bet the marine corps is the same they say every marine a rifleman including the officers and the pilots but uh for heaven's sakes if someone wants to be a military pilot but doesn't want to fire a rifle i think they better examine their motives yeah, exactly. Yeah, we shoot a lot. So, yeah, that sounds good to me. I live in a place where it's hard to shoot these days. So <laughs> I kind of miss it. But all right, Nick, well, uh, I want to thank you for your time and your 11 years of service. You sound like one of the more junior folks we've had on the show, but I thought you did a great job. Thanks for stopping by today. Yeah, no problem. Glad we could finally get around to doing this. I know we've been trying for months, but uh, you know, we had to wait for Army Aviation Month. So you were a good sport. Exactly. Um, I'll hang in there for you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, stay in touch and let us know how your career goes. Yeah, no problem. You've been listening to Army Aviation Month here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. For more information on the show, visit our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com, where you can also find a catalog of other show topics, as well as military aviation-themed merchandise, such as books and apparel. For exclusive content and to help support the show, be sure to check out our Patreon page. This episode was brought to you by BVR Productions and produced by our friends at the Muscle Car Place Podcast Network. Thanks for listening. Sir, yes, sir!